Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us tonight and being here virtually, wherever you are, probably all over the world. I'm Tatevi Kaivazian. I'm the director of Armenian Institute. This event had to take place a few, few weeks ago, a few weeks before this, but it was postponed when the war in Artsakh broke out. Initially, we were too upset and worried and concerned, and we postponed a number of events. But with the time, we feel that there is a need to get together to share and celebrate Armenian culture. So while all our hearts are heavy with concern and pain, we hope this event will bring some lights to all of us. Culture is also a powerful tool to raise much needed funds for displaced people in Artsakh. Yesterday, Armenian Institute held a major fundraising event, bringing together a number of performers, artists, poets, and entertainers. And I'm extremely proud to say that in one day, we managed to raise about 14,000 pounds. The fundraiser is still open. It will be open for a few more days. I will share some links in the chat line, but I will encourage all of you to go and watch the video if you haven't seen it yet enjoy it and of course if you can donate we'll be very grateful for your support and i know some of you who are here have already donated so thank you very much it's much appreciated um i will later share the link so you can see a few housekeeping points um, you probably realize you are all muted but you will have a chance to ask questions and um, and mute it later on. We are recording the event, so please turn your videos off if you don't want to be seen. Uh, we will also share a feedback form in the chat line for you to fill in. We'll be very grateful if you spend a minute on that. Um, and you can start asking your questions in the chat line, which we'll be monitoring already in advance. <laughs> And uh, now it's my great pleasure to invite my colleague, Susan Patti, who is the former founding director of Armenian Institute, current program manager and academic advisor to present our tonight's um, uh, guests, Karen and Shake. Thank you, Dr. Vig. It is really my pleasure to introduce Karen and later on Shake. Uh, I first met Karen many now years ago when she suddenly appeared in our Armenian Institute office uh, where Gagik and I were working and um, asked for some advice for her PhD. Uh, this woman is so multi-talented and ambitious that she wasn't satisfied that she was already producing all kinds of wonderful paintings and was very successful in pottery, uh, making sculptures. Um, she also began to do creative writing projects and a very thought-provoking uh, photo essay on identity and, of course, a dissertation and all of this. And she managed to do it all and um, got her PhD and fortunately has stayed in, not only in touch with us, but has been working, collaborating with us ever since. So it's been a wonderful, long relationship. Karen was born in Iran, in Tehran, and came to the UK in 1978, when, where she, uh, they settled in Leeds. And now Karen and her family live in Appleby, in, the, in Cumbria. Um, she is still an artist. She's an artist and a writer and a curator. Um, and she has pieces in private and public collections all, all over around the world. Um, her current show, Swallows and Armenians Flying the Nest, just closed in Northumberland and will open again on April 24th in uh, 2021 in Hexham. So I hope that we'll be able to go and see, I hope we'll be able to travel at that point and be able to go and visit that. I will introduce Shake when uh, Karen is finished, so we'll wait for that. But right now, Karen, I'd like to hand over to you, please. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for coming tonight. I'm really, really overwhelmed. We've got 54 participants. This is great. I've seen a lot of um, friends and um, people that I know professionally and personally, socially, who have joined. So thank you. Thank you so much. Before I start, I just wanted to um, give thanks, really, to a few people. 
um, who um, have supported this project from the start and um, first and foremost, the Gazellian and Altrinian families for their ongoing support of the project, loaning work for exhibitions and giving access to and permission to use their photographs, their family photographs and archives. Um, also grateful thanks to the Arthur Ransom Archive, which is held in special collections at the University of Leeds, and they've given me access to letters, diary extracts and photographs. Um, I'm also very grateful for permissions that have been granted from the Arthur Ransom Literary Trustees for the use of images and extracts for this whole project. And by this project, I mean this ongoing project. Um, it would not have been possible to do all this without um, the support of Arts Council lottery funding. And uh, with it, I've been able to achieve far beyond what I thought was possible. And finally, a big thank you to the Armenian Institute and fantastic staff there. I mean, in particular, Susan Patty and Tatevik Ivaisian, thank you for your encouragement and support. And other staff, wonderful people, Gagig Stepan Sarkisian, a wonderful librarian and mentor, so knowledgeable, has helped me so much in all my projects. And Stephen Masters also holding my hand in the technicalities of all this Zooming. So I'm going to now start screen sharing. Uh, Swallows and the Amazons was published in 1930 and still the ethnicity of the real children who inspired the fictional Walker family is not very widely known. Where I live now, Lake District Tourism presents a very white English cultural menu of the Wordsworths, Beatrix Potter, John Ruskin and of course Arthur Ransom. Ransom's books have come to stand for something quintessentially English when ironically and in reality this gaggle of upper middle class English children having jolly jates, sailing and camping was inspired by Anglo-Armenian children from Aleppo, Syria. Swallows and Armenians began in 2017 as a small exhibition in the dining room gallery of Thorny Howe, a youth hostel in Grasmere in the heart of the Lake District. Thanks to the hospitality and encouragement of the owners, Taylor and Caroline Nuttall. It was the start of a passionate love affair with a fascinating story about the Altunians, a family who had the same ethnicity as myself and who, like me, lived as comfortably in two or more worlds. As I am a visual artist, the project began as an exhibition, but it soon became something much more that encompassed creative writing in the form of a book of short stories, an audio book, film and performative works. In 2019, Swallows and Armenians was launched with support from Arts Council lottery funding and unexpectedly also the Arthur Ransom Society, TARS, with a book launch at Words by the Water, Festival of Words at Theatre by the Lake in Keswick. Alongside an exhibition on two floors. A devised performance by Young Company, the youth outreach arm of the theatre, whose participants were children from Keswick and the surrounding towns and villages. A collection of historic portraits and other works by three artists, W.G. Collingwood, who is the children's grandfather in Coniston, by which I mean the Swallows children, the Altunyan children. Dora Altunyan, their mother, is another of the artists, and Mavis Gazellian, and we know her more familiarly as Titty. And these were all generously loaned. What an amazing collection by the Gazellian family. This more ambitious project brought in partners, actor-musician Persia Babayan Taylor, who is my daughter, to co-direct the performance by Young Company, and dance artist Shake Major Chilingirian, who brought her circle of dance, life dance project 
in the recognition of the contribution the Altunyan Hospital made to the lives of genocide survivors in Aleppo. Shakir is someone whose Anglo-Armenian history is almost identical to mine and whom I have known since childhood in Iran. There is a fourth lady in this picture, Zina Ashbury, who will, uh, I will also be talking about later. With further funding secured, Swallows and Armenians Flying the Nest was born, taking the exhibition further afield to venues in Carlisle and Northumberland, whilst creating a more grown-up script for theatre, mentored by playwright Mick Yates, and bringing the stories in the book literally to life with an audiobook narrated by Persia Babayan Taylor. Together, we are reasserting the importance of this Anglo-Armenian family from Aleppo in an adventure story written for children that has become part of English Lake District mythology. But why is this important? To ignore the cultural background of the children is to miss the relevance of this story to our own lived experience of the world. It misses the opportunity of introducing British and international audiences and children of an ethnically diverse mix to the rich literary heritage of the Lake District. Now I'm going to show you part of a short film that brings all the elements of the Swallows and Armenians project together in one place. And this film tours with the exhibition as an independent piece of art. So I shall just optimize. The swallow was building a nest, building and singing. With each twig she placed, she remembered last year's home. Once before, she had built a nest and laboured hard over it. But that time, upon her return, she found the nest in ruins. Now she was building a nest again, building and singing. With each twig she arranged, she remembered the nest before. So she builds her nest again, building and singing. With each twig she entwines, remembers last year's home. My grandfather will always... Okay. Um, this recently discovered photo of Dora Ernest and Ernest Altunyan and four of their five children, photographed in around 1922-23, was sent to me recently by Barbara Altunyan, who is Roger's daughter, and her partner, John Greenwood. And I'm very grateful to them for sending me this. I think it's the first time it's been seen in the public domain. In the middle stands Taki. Also, her full name is Taki Harriet Altunyan. Um, she was born in Hampstead, London in 1917. Uh, Taki was named after her great-grandmother from Sivas in Ottoman Turkey. And Harriet is also after her great-grandmother, uh, uh, Northern Irish great-grandmother, 
um, who married Azador Altunian. Um, okay, so uh, Susie um, is sitting by her mother to her right, and Susie is also called Arsha Luis, and Arsha Luis is um, morning light in Armenian. Arsha Luis was born two years later in 1919. Mavis Araxi, who we know as Titi, sits by Ernest um, to, on the left hand side. Um, Araxi is um, she, a name after the Arax or Aras River, which runs through Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. The baby in this photograph is Roger. Uh, Roger Edward Collingwood Altunyan, rather a big name for a little boy, born in 1922, and he's the only one without an Armenian name, but apparently Roger is after uh, a character in one of Ernest's favourite adventure books. The uh, fifth child, Bridget, is not here because she hasn't been born yet. Bridget Ma Mary Lucine. Lucine means moon in Armenian, or Lucine Altunyan, um, born in 1926. These children had Armenian, Northern Irish, Swiss, and English heritage. The children lived in Aleppo, where their paternal grandparents, Aram Asador Altunyan, um, an ambitious doctor from Sivas, and Harriet Riddle, a Northern Irish matron from the College Hospital in Ain Tab lived and they established the first modern hospital there in Syria. The children's father Ernest, himself a brilliant doctor, um, helped to run it and their mother Dora was an artist from the Collingwood family of Lake District artists, writers and philosophers with links to the Victorian art critic and social thinker John Ruskin. The children spoke Armenian, Turkish, English, French and Arabic and the food they ate was a similar cultural mix. They visited their maternal grandparents every few years in Coniston, where they felt equally at home, um, as in Aleppo. This is a portrait of um, Aram Asadur Altunyan. He was known by the children as Black Grandpa because his, he had a shock of jet black hair. No matter how old he got, his hair didn't grey. <laughs> um, so... It was in Coniston where the families came together once more as Ransom had recently returned from his Russian adventures with Evgenia, his second wife, and settled in the area. This is a, a very nice photograph of Arthur Ransom standing with, the, I think, the Howgills behind him. Um, so um, Ransom knew the Collingwoods very well indeed already visiting and staying with them regularly and saw himself as an honorary member. He had met W.G. Collingwood as a teenager whilst walking in the fells above Coniston. W.G., Dora's father, was impressed already by the aspirations of this young writer and Ransom already knew W.G.'s work because one of his favourite childhood books was Thornstein of the Mere, a saga of the Northmen in Lakeland, written by Collingwood, and it was about a young Viking boy settled at Greenodd, which is only a few miles from Coniston. Arthur was very much in need of a father figure, um, as he'd lost his own father when he was 12. So he called W.G.'s wife, um, she was, her formal name was Edith Mary, everybody called her Dory, but he called her aunt. And in turn, the Altunyan children affectionately called Arthur, Uncle Arthur, and his wife, Aunt Jenya. The Collingwood family home was Lane Head on the shores of Coniston Water. Although they lived in a grand house, it was not theirs, but it was owned by the heiress of a Liverpool shipping company, who, by way of patronage, allowed them to live there rent free. Although they had a cook and seemed to live grandly, in a grand style, I suppose, W.G. and his wife, Dory, they lived a hand-to-mouth existence in the sense that um, he, with his work for John Ruskin and later as Professor of Fine Art at Reading, and she, Dory, painted miniature portraits for wealthy Lake District families, um, and they somehow made ends meet. 
both were involved with homeschooling the, their children in the arts, the languages, archaeology and philosophy. Um, Arthur fell in love with this attractively bohemian family. And here they are. <laughs> Uh, he went sailing and fishing with the children who were of a similar age. Dora, the eldest of the, the um, children, um, and his siblings, Barbara, Robin, and Ursula, all in age, age order. They're here with their mother, Edith Mary, also known as Dory. Although he later proposed as a young man to both Dora and Barbara, um, he was rejected. But they were... they felt a great deal of affection for him and stayed close friends with him uh, and he with them. Um, he did eventually marry uh, a lady called Ivy Walker. Now, if you're familiar with Swallows and Amazons, you will recognise the name Walker because the family is called the Walkers. Um, they had one child, Tabitha, but he was estranged from both because uh, marriage and responsibility at that Point in his life stifled his writing and he escaped by going to Russia in order to learn the language so that he could research his book of Russian fairy tales. Now by a stroke of good fortune he was asked to step in as foreign correspondent for the Manchester Guardian in Russia and it was whilst trying to interview Trotsky during the Bolshevik Revolution couldn't make it up really, that he met and uh, met a lady called Evgenia Shelopina um, because she was Trotsky's secretary at the time and they eventually married. Um, in the meantime, Dora Collingwood, his childhood sweetheart or one of them, married Ernest Altunian, um, a friend of her brother's from school in rugby. She had already met um, Ernest 10 years prior as a gauche 15-year-old. Well, he was a gauche 15-year-old. She was a much more uh, worldly wise 18-year-old. Um, when her brother brought him school, home from, from school one weekend from rugby. Um, and by the way, Arthur also went to rugby school and knew Ernest also from those school days. Dora and Ernest moved to London, had two children, uh, there and then they went back to Aleppo for Ernest to help his father with the family hospital. Three more children were born in Aleppo. And then in 1928, in the summer of 28, the family returned to Coniston and found Arthur and Evgenia now living there also. That summer of sailing, camping and fishing with the family was the catalyst for Ransom to embark on his writing for his first adventure fiction book, for children, to the six for whom it was written in exchange for a pair of slippers. Arthur put this dedication uh, to the family in the, into the first editions of Swallows and Amazons, but it was later removed and replaced by an introduction which stated that it was Arthur's own childhood that inspired it. He further distanced himself from the Altunian children in his autobiography where he writes, they had identified themselves, regardless of sex, with my characters. The family say he told Tacky that he'd had to turn her into John so that he'd have another boy in the story. Tacky often signed her letters to Uncartha as Captain John of SD Swallow, something which at the time he obviously hadn't discouraged. In her book, Chimes from a Wooden Bell, Tacky writes, Titty and Roger were very true to life. Susie, we thought, a little too good. His reasons for sidelining the family and their influence on him were many and various, but the result is that however much the work of Arthur Ransom is cherished by generations of people who feel it is part of their family story, as a result of the denial, by ransom of the family's involvement and then subsequent depictions of the children as Anglo-Saxon white, many others may well have made, been made to feel excluded. Uh, this is a wall-based text work of the, of the dedication that accompanies the exhibition. 
1974 version of the film is beloved by fans of the book series and it's felt to be the best version and closest to Ransom's vision. Here, Titty is played by Sophie Neville. Sophie Neville has published a book, Secrets of Filming Swallows and Amazons, and in the tra trailer, which you can see on YouTube, you can see another little girl here, who was an extra in the film. Her name is Zina Khan, and she is half English, half Indian, was born in Windermere and grew up there. Her experiences of remarks made to her by casting directors of the film of being made to feel other and out of place in her own home environment during filming is told in Perfect Look, one of the stories in my book. The telling of her story and her involvement in the project has been a process of catharsis for Zena. Her story is central to how children from mixed backgrounds today continue to feel excluded from British society, British history, and cultural institutions. And this must change so that we can properly appreciate the ethnic richness of British culture. Here she is joining us at Theatre by the Lake for the launch of Swallows and Armenians. The Walker family, as presented by Ransom, is white British a reflection of the culture Ransom was most familiar. So it may seem appropriate to producers who wish to create authentic film or theatrical versions of the book to continue to depict the family through a narrow prism of what was considered British in 1930, even in this casting of the most recent Swallows and Amazons film released in 2016. However, the Altunyan family are a prime example of a culturally mixed British family, highly relevant to and mirrored in hundreds of thousands of culturally mixed British families today. Here are the four eldest children, Taki, Susie, Titi and Roger, in their scouts outfits. The photograph is taken around 1927 a year before they would have met with Ankatha in 1928. Change is coming, but very slowly. I was delighted to, to discover that Ransom's original dedication to the Altunians has come back into the recent reprints of Swallows and Amazons and can be seen alongside Ransom's own version of the history of the book. Bristol Old Vic introduced a more culturally diverse version, version of Swallows and Amazons with Akia Henry, a black British actor in the role of Titty in 2010, followed here by York Theatre Royal in August 2019, casting Anglo-Egyptian actor, musician Hannah Khogali in the role, a special invitation from York Theatre Royal to Azador Gazelian, Titty's son, to see the show and meet the cast and directors made it a very poignant event. Much of the artwork in the exhibition has grown out of the Altunyan and Gazellian family photo archive. This piece is entitled, Write Me Something to Smell the Wind and Rain Again. I've taken this from a letter Ernest wrote to Arthur. Ernest loved the Lake District and called Lanehead his home in the north. The photo is taken by Dora and includes her sister Barbara sailing the boat like a pro, Taki and Susie on the right, and Titty on her nanny Elmas's knee. Elmas, which um, is the name for a kind of a rough diamond, um, came from a mountain village in Syria, possibly Sulkuluk, where the family spent the summers. These children were homeschooled by tutors brought over from England. These tutors were trained by the Parents' National Education Union. They were used to an open curriculum with time for art, poetry and imaginative play, free-spirited, and unconstrained by the social norms of the time. 
The three girls appear again here on Mavis, one of the two boats belonging to the family in Coniston. The other is named Swallow. This piece is called Here Are the Swallows. It's a model boat for the exhibition and I've painted it in the authentic colours of the original boat with the images of the three Altoon young girls printed on the sail. The work has been literally the flagship of the project, appearing on the cover of the book and exhibition posters. Mavis, the boat, uh, which still belongs to the Altoon young family, is on permanent loan to the Ruskin Museum in Coniston. You may well be confused here by, by the name of the boat in the picture, it says Amazon, um, but it was restored by the Arthur Ransom Society and it was decided to change the name, the name of the boat. I'm told by the now retired curator, Vicky Slow, that there was quite a lot of discussion as to whether it would be Amazon or another suggestion was two birds, which referred to the fact that Mavis and Swallow are both names of birds. In fact, Mavis is French for a song thrush. But, of course, Amazon won out in this curious case of fiction over fact. But it is interesting to note that this was done under the leadership of Bridget, the youngest of the Altunian children, who became the first president of the Arthur Ransom Society. In this photo, Arthur and his wife Evgenia are with four of the children, Titty, Taki, Roger and Bridget. It's taken in Aleppo during their visit to the family in 1932. The Ransoms stayed for three months and Arthur wrote most of Peter Duck, his third book of the series, there in Dora's studio at the top of the house. The cracks in the relationship between the Ransoms and the Altunians start during this trip, of which more later. Ransom used three of the children's names in the book, Susan, Titty and Roger. But it is Titty's name, unusual even in its day, that fixes the Altunian family to the walkers. This print on aluminium has been developed from the back of one of the family photographs with the ghostly images of the children bleeding through. Before the fallout in 1931, Ransom wrote an article for an American magazine, The Horn Book, Volume 7. On page 38 to 43, entitled Swallows and Amazons, How It Came to Be Written, he writes, and if you start from around here, about once in every five years, a friend of mine who has an enormous family and lives in Syria brings his family home and spends the summer with them on the shores of a lake, which he and his wife and I have known ever since we were ourselves children. We have played about in boats on it ever since we can remember. Syria is mostly made, I believe, of sand. Anyhow, that is what it sounds like. And though now this friend of mine, whom I will call Walker, has found a place where he can sail up to the time when he last came home. He had not found this place and always looked forward to coming home, chiefly because of being able to once more sail in a small boat. And his children are in this matter just like him. The time they spend without a boat is used up in looking forward to the time when they will have to boat again, have a boat again. They are the sort of children who would put to sea in a bran tub if they had nothing better. The article continues in this vein with Arthur using the Walker name to describe the Altunian family living as they did in Syria. It is, I think, irrefutable evidence that Arthur connected the Altunian family with the Walkers. In his mind, at that time, they are one and the same. This photo of Ernest, I'm also going to call him Colonel Walker here, um, is with one of the boats on Coniston Water. And um, of course, with Remember as Sunday just gone, uh, it's interesting to know that Ernest served valiantly in the Royal Army Medical Corps during World War I. 
and was awarded the Military Cross in France for gallantry in action. Okay, diaries. Um, this is Arthur's diary and it shows indications of the first signs of conflict. It's dated uh, Tuesday 29th of March 1932 and you can see here row with Ernest. What has occurred? This is Evgenia's diary dated 13th uh, of April 1932 and if you look here from here we may just catch um, the Scottish Prince at Cyprus if we start at once. After a lot of telephoning and telegraphing, packed up in three hours, drove violently to Alexandretta, caught the Milano there. And then at the bottom, she puts, terribly upset by Dora's and children's tears at parting. We wonder why they have left in such a hurry and Ernest's letter to Arthur dated 15th of June 1932 gives us a clue and um, his writing is quite difficult to read and this is just one page of his letter but I shall read you the first uh, paragraph and then I shall take sections from it. My dear Arthur, your manly letter straight from the shoulder with your yachting cap stuck at an aggressive angle to the unworthy father of poor children who are not being given a chance was I am sure well meant. Psychological bilge is certainly a curious acknowledgement of an attempt that was at least sincere. Anyway, whatever you may think of our future plans, I would only ask you to believe that Dora and I are acting in agreement and I am not managing her in the least. I notice you also consider that I have been inconsiderate enough to keep her out in the East too long. The truth is that it will take a good deal to persuade her that either we and our children are so out of it as to feel like savages when we land in England. And then further down in the letter, he, he tries to assert that the children are not missing out in terms of school. He says, the standards of education um, as to their standards of education, they have had their examination papers sent twice a year to the PNEU, Parents National Education Union, and their papers marked and commented on. And then further down in the letter, um, there's an almost pleading tone which really wrenches at the heartstrings. He says, this is a kind of uh, personal kind of personal plea to Arthur why after years of apparent friendship you should suddenly decide that I am such a pernicious and underhand person I can't think so in Ernest's letter uh, the principal things that he covers are the children's schooling and standards of education uh, have been discussed by Arthur and Evgenia um, the fact that uh, it's, it's, it's been suggested that he's controlling Dora and keeping her away from the West, possibly away from civilization, perhaps. Ernest asks, what happened to our friendship? Ernest has thought up to now that they, they were on equal footing, but um, as far as Arthur's uh, comments, those have suggested that perhaps they are not. On Monday 30th of May 1932, Evgenia writes again in her diary and they are in England, back in England now, and she says, Ursula came to discuss our Aleppo experiences and the question of schools for the Altunian's children. This piece um, is called School Shoes, schools, <laughs> School Shoes, and contains a photo of Titi as a very little girl. She must be about three and a half, four years old, and her mum, Dora. Titi is wearing a bandolier, which is a bullet belt. Um, and for me, it's a reminder of the dangerous times in which they were living. In Aleppo uh, at that time, uh, the city was under French mandate and the Altunians stayed there, were living there really by the skin of their teeth to continue the hospital work. Um, and they 
I think were allowed to stay there by virtue of their usefulness, but they were ever wary of the dangers that they faced with the Turkish troops also present in the city. The family also say that um, the family by which I mean the Altunyan family also say that Arthur and Evgenia wished to take Titi with them back to England. Barbara Altunyan, Roger's daughter, has written, Uncle Arthur always liked Titi. She was very artistic and imaginative, and so they had a lot in common in that respect. He used to send her snippets of his new book and pictures that he had started to draw, which she could finish. Those pictures ended up in some of the books. Barbara says Ransom had basically insinuated that Aleppo was not a good place to bring up Titi and that they could give her a better life and education in England. And says Barbara, her parents took great offence, as you can imagine, actually, and Arthur and Evgenia left very abruptly. This is an entry in Evgenia's diary, which is quite poignant, actually. So by now, it's 1933, and children are in England. At least, yes, Titty is in England. Um, Sunday, January the 8th, Titty came to stay. And on Wednesday, 11th of January, 1933, Dora, Ernest and Miss Foreman to tea, very frozen and cross because the car broke down on the way and they waited in a cold garage a long time whilst it was put to right. Titty gone back to Lane Head with them. These two diary extracts are all that may point to another, this point of tension between the two families, which is over Titty in particular. At the first exhibition in Grasmere, with the Altunyan and Gazellian family members gathered, there was a first mention uh, that the Ransoms wished to adopt Titi. The idea became more concrete with two further mentions, both ironically by members of the Arthur Ransom Society itself. John Berry, who was friends with both the Ransoms and the Altunyans, writes in his book, Discovering Ransoms, Swallows and Ransoms, in 2005, uh, where he references this portrait of Titi. The eight R's subsequently asked Ernest if they might adopt her. Not surprising, he refused, and Dora gave them her portrait of Titi instead. Roger Wardale, a founding member and former chairman of the Arthur Ransom Society, concurs in his 2015 book, In Search of Swallows and Amazons. He says, Titty was the Ransom's favourite and the childless Ransom's would have liked to adopt her. Instead, they were given this portrait painted by her mother. This portrait, sorry, this photograph shows the portrait at the Heald, the Ransom's home partway up Coniston Water. According to Wardale, they took it with them everywhere, which surely indicates the portrait and the child meant a great deal to them. This wall-based text piece in gold is My Ode to Titty from Swallows and Amazons, Chapter 29, Two Sorts of Fish. And um, it is widely acknowledged, I think, that Ransom saw himself as Captain Flint. So imagine it's Captain Flint. So it says, there's treasure and treasure, said Captain Flint. It takes all sorts to make a world. You know, able seaman, I can never say thank you enough to you. If I'd lost this as I thought I had, I'd have lost all the diaries of my pirate past and I've put all the best of my life into this book. It would have gone forever if it hadn't been for you. Ransom writes Titi as the heroine of the story in Swallows and Amazons and this heartfelt thanks may reflect the way he felt about the real child, I think. Gradually, Arthur and Jenya became increasingly estranged from Ernest, the child's father, and then one by one from the adult children themselves. Sadly, in later years, paranoia overtook reason in assuming the family were unjustly promoting their connection to the book. This is uh, one of Arthur's diary entries. It's a little bit hard to follow, but... Um, if you have a look down here and, it, and then continue up here, this is a section I want you to have a look at. 
uh, date is Sunday, 17th of August, 1959. Ernest Altunian brought a Mr. Berry, in brackets, who had called it Lane Head. Why? With an answer I had written to a fan letter of 20 years ago. Ernest had put him up at Lanehead for three days and, as usual, had more or less given him to suppose that he, Ernest, made my books. What a man! But in the end, I shall be driven to explain that all I had done was to give the little Armenians the fun of pretending. After Arthur's death... Evgenia takes it to a new level, following a TV programme where Titi was interviewed on the connection between the families. Uh, this is a little bit difficult to read because uh, in the old fashioned way, it's a carbon copy of a typewritten letter. Um, so um, I'd like you to look at this paragraph here and just remember what Ransom said in his uh, Horn magazine article about the walkers away in Syria, etc., etc. So she says, Uncle Arthur never mentioned either publicly or privately the name Altunian in connection with Swallows, uh, in connection with any of his books. The dedication of Swallows and Amazons was quite anonymous enough. The name John, Susan, Roger and Bridget were ordinary and common enough. Titty was different, but then you have stopped using it very early on. And yet she addresses her as Titty. I think that's very interesting. And John was not an Altunian name. There was nothing to connect you with the walkers. And you could have remained anonymous if you so wished, but obviously some, if not all of you, preferred a bit of publicity and reflected glory. And then if you um, look up here and look at this paragraph here on the second page, second paragraph, this refers to an interview that Titty gives to a local TV station. Uh, but your own performance is the last straw. Someone told me about it, and not without difficulty, I got a transcript of the broadcast. You may think that you were paying a pious tribute to Uncle Arthur's memory, but I call it something very, 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 three berries, different. It was a show in very bad taste. It makes me sick. And I'm, it must have made Uncle Arthur turn in his grave in disgust. The poisonous correspondence from Evgenia to Titty on the subject resulted in the relationship coming, as you can imagine, to an irreparable end. But Evgenia, Evgenia's is not the last word. And I wish instead to celebrate the lives of the Altunian children their achievements, and those of their parents and grandparents. Um, and this is a first. Here is an excerpt of the audio book, which will be released by Christmas, I hope, um, at audible.com. It is narrated by my daughter, Persia Babayan Taylor, and it's a snapshot of the lives of the children in Aleppo. Eventually, thinking their father might soon be called, the children quietened down and settled into a more studious frame of mind, broken by intermittent yawns and stretches. Their teacher, herself now desperate for a refreshing cup of tea, gave them the longed-for moment and rang a little bell which she took out of her pocket. We shall have a twenty-minute break, and I want you to stay in the vicinity of the drawing room, notwithstanding the need to use the lavs, and I will see you back here on the strike of half past the hour. Makrui, their nanny, had been waiting for the signal and came in as Miss S went out, with four large oranges and a bowl of sugar lumps. The children took an orange each. Merci, digin Makrui! Squeezing and squashing them between their palms, they worked the fruits until they were softened without splitting. Then with one bite and a sugar lump clamped firmly between their teeth, they noisily sucked out the sour juice. 
as each sugar lump disintegrated, so it was quickly replaced. Rivlets of orange ran down their chins and were hastily wiped away on their sleeves. The skins were soon sucked dry and the children ran off. Roger grabbed a handful of sugar lumps, crunching on them as they all clattered down the steps, bolted out through the heavy front door, climbed the perimeter wall and were soon on the far side of the Muslim graveyard across the road from the house. Far enough away that when Miss returned twenty minutes later, no amount of shouting and gesticulating could get the children back. As she waved frantically at them, so they waved in return and smiled broadly, sending her into paroxysms of shrieking, until at last she turned and went inside, just as the startled figure of Jenia appeared on the balcony. The children quickly ducked behind the wall and hid. When it seemed safe to peep, she had gone and the children carried on with their games. They returned an hour later. They were starting to feel thirsty again and hungry, and were told Miss S was ill in bed and there would be no more lessons that day. Roger jigged about with delight to shouts of, Hooray! from the girls. Let's go to the hospital kitchen, everyone, said Susie, and they all agreed as their rumbling tummies responded to the likeliest place to grab a pre-lunch snack. The children ran out of the house and across Sharia al Tunyan to the back of the hospital, dodging Fatan Dranik at the plant room. Down the dark corridor they scampered, past the washrooms where all the hospital linen was laundered, and into the airy kitchen, where a big pot of simmering bone stock, the grey foam scum neatly collected from the top, sent plumes of fragrant steam into the air. They were surrounded by frenetic activity and mountains of food, Onions peeled, chopped and grated, piles of fresh herbs, coriander, mint, tarragon, fenugreek and spring onions. A mound of mince goat meat was set on a platter on the massive table in the middle of the room. Next to it was a huge bowl of sulking bulgur, and next to that a wide and shallow pan of fragrant fried goat's mince, sliced almonds, onions and spices. They're making kibbe! said Roger. It's my favourite! Everything's your favourite, Roger, said Susie. But this is my best favourite in the whole wide world! Eventually. <laughs> um, and a uh, little animation made during lockdown with support from uh, the Armenian Institute Animation Studio. They sailed at one with their vessels, at one with the wind, the lake, the sky and the mountains, drawing ahead one minute and falling back the next. Suddenly they were close to Fur Island. Its colony of cormorants and glimpses of flashing minnows signalled they were approaching the shallows of their own Peel Island. Um, nearly finally, uh, this wonderful uh, celebratory photograph with all the partners that I have had with this fantastic journey. Shaki, Major Chilling, Irian, lovely friend, Zina Ashbury. Um, Shaki is an old friend, Zina is a new friend and just as dear. Uh, Rahel Gazelian, Titi's daughter, who's been so generous in the sharing of the family collection, she and her brother, um, of paintings, but also in terms of stories, in terms of inf information, and her, of course her hospitality, uh, where I've stayed with her, which is very, very kind. Uh, and my own daughter, Persia Babayan Taylor, and this photograph is taken um, in Carlisle at the old fire station in March this year. The stories I've created in Swallows and Armenians are resonant in our own times of conflict, displacement and dangerous nationalisms. 
we are all still reeling from the terrible loss of life and significant loss of areas of Artsakh in the war with Azerbaijan. The uneasy peace treaty brokered by Russia reminds me of Ransom's own connections with Russia, his time during the Bolshevik revolution. The Bolsheviks promised Karabakh to Armenia, but in 1921, the Soviet Union agreed to a division under which Karabakh would be under the control of Azerbaijan, despite the area being populated by a majority of ethnic Armenians and an important part of historic Armenia. The Armenian genocide is mentioned at length in Swallows and Armenians because it was a fact of the Altunyan children's lives. The threat of genocidal intent in the recent war with Azerbaijan with the involvement of Turkey and their mercenaries is frightening and alarming. Many of the survivors of the Armenian genocide settled in Syria and were made refugees once more through the civil war there. Some 29 refugee families, around 90 people, were resettled in Artsakh and have now again fled for their lives once more. Ransom's family, the Walkers, by which I mean the Altunians, are internationally connected and relevant to our times. This joyous photograph of Shaki on the shores of Derwent Water was taken by Azador Gazelian, Titi's son, and appeared in the Times newspaper on Monday the 11th of March 2019. Swallows and Ar Armenians is published by the Wild Pansy Press, University of Leeds. And it's available through my website, which is there. And the Audible, uh, Audible will be uh, launching Swallows and Armenians, the aud audiobook, soon. And as Susan mentioned, the exhibition is continuing to fly the nest. Uh, the exhibition that was due to happen this year will be happening next year. And... Uh, significantly starts on the 24th of April to the 5th of June, 24th of April being the commemoration day for the Armenian genocide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, am I muted? No. Uh... Can you hear me speaking? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I never know if I'm on or off or what's happening here. Thank you very much for that trip to Syria and back and around the Lake District. Uh, uh, fascinating story, and uh, I feel quite attached to the story, having known Taki quite well for a number of years. Very fortunate to have known her. It's wonderful that there's that connection with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was really with loved ones, my husband's family. Um, but then uh, Taki and I got along super well. Yeah. She, it was terrific. Fantastic. Uh, and, and very much the fighter that you sort of, <laughs> mm. <laughs> strong woman. And I actually got to meet Titi as well and her husband. So it's very, really special. Um, we, we don't have any questions in our, in our chat line. Um, if anybody has one and would like to ask it right away, we could, uh, we're kind of running over into Shaki's time now. I'd like to move on, um, make sure that we have enough time for Shaki and the dancing. But if anybody does have a question now, could you please quickly type it into the um, chat line? It's very hard to look through the, um, we have what, how many people? 57 people, guys. That's great. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody, by the way. Thanks for staying and, as well. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully illustrated, Karen, and very interesting. And I, I, your points are very well taken about the, the diversity that's here but overlooked. Yes. Um, it's, it's really all over the country, yeah. not just in, you know, where you would think it's in the Lake District. So I, I think your points are very well taken. You know what, we, why don't we come back? There aren't any questions in the chat line. So Karen, if that's okay with you, let's go on to Shaki. And if, if some questions appear in the chat line, then if we have time, we'll come back to them later on, okay? 
great. And we know we're going to see more of you. So goodbye for now to Karen. And if I could welcome Shakye. Um, and now, how are we going to get the view on Shakye? Are we going to... Shakye, maybe if you say hello, your voice will start. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you are. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> Great. This is Shakye. Great. You. And as Karen said quite rightly a, a, um, a little bit ago, these two wonderful women have got a lot in common, starting from babyhood, basically, both British-Armenian and both um, with their childhood in Tehran. Uh, Shaki born here, but then moved there and uh, came back here the same year as, as uh, Karen, 78. Yep. It's not so much a coincidence as a yes. fact of history, yes. but it's um, very, it's wonderful that you've had this long friendship and collaboration well, you know, Susan, we actually got together because of the Armenian Institute. Oh, we, <laughs> we knew of each other. We haven't known each other since babies. We knew each other. We knew e each other existed because we were quite rare being half-breeds, you know, British Armenians. Not many of us at that time. And Shake uh, and I met and she came to my house. That was it, really. We didn't have a friendship. We just knew of each other. And then it wasn't until um, the project with Armenian Institute that we were put together quite randomly. And then we both went, I know you. And it Nothing's was random, Karen. Nothing's <laughs> random. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, we've been inseparable. Well, as, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's great. Well, let me introduce her. That's that's a great story, and we're proud to be part of this. Was that salon mashup we guys got together? Yes, it was. Well, that was not a random thing. Sato worked hard on thinking who goes well. Um, back to you, Shake. <laughs> we got to um, Shake. Yes, moved to the UK in '78. Then it took them what 20, 30 years to get together after that, but that's okay. Shaki is a solo dance artist and a choreographer, performer, and, and she's also a very devoted teacher of dance uh, with a very large following, many of whom are here today. And her focus is on the spiritual aspects of dance, and she illustrates this beautifully in her own dance and also in her teaching and her talking about dance. Shaki has given uh, workshops and performances around the world, and now on Zoom, uh, the last time we had dancing on Zoom, I couldn't believe it. It really does work. <laughs> so I hope everybody's up for it tonight. And Shaki continues to lead dance sessions around Europe at the moment, again, on Zoom, but uh, otherwise in these wonderful workshops. Um, so, Shaki, I believe it. First, you're going to read a poem called Memory by Razaros Aranyan. So, Shaki, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm on. Yes. Wonderful. So, I want to say how much of a privilege it is for me to be part of the journey of Swallows, of Ar Swallows and Armenians um, and to absolutely reiterate everything that Karen said in terms of how we were put together and how our the new leg of our journey started, our artistic collaboration and our friendship indeed. Um, and so I thank Armenian Institute um, and I thank um, our lucky stars, if I may say that. <laughs> so um, yes, I would like to read a, a poem that is called Hishorutun in Armenian, which is translated as memory. First in Armenian, it's a poem written in the 19th century by Razaros Aran, Aradan, sorry, Arayan. <laughs> yes, Razaros Arayan. Um, and then I will read the English translation by um, my husband, Harach Tulingirian. And um, I think you will see the relevance here. And then I will lead you on to the circle of life and explain to you what that is all about. So first with the poem. So, Hishorutun. Zizernaga bune shinum, yev shinum er yev yerkum. Amen mitur gapsnelis, arachvabun er hishum. Mek ankam er nabun shinel, yev shad ankam karkatel. 
բայց այս անգամ վերադարձին բույնն ավերագել գտել։ Այժմ նորից բույն էր շինում և շինում էր և երկում, ամեն մի ճող կպցնելիս առաջվա բույն էր հիշում։ Նա հիշում էր անցած տարին, իր սնված ծակերին, որոնց ճամպին հապշտակեց ամեն մի ճող կպցնելիս առաջվա բույներ իշում։ And the English translation, memory. The swallow was building a nest, building and singing. Each twig she attached, she remembered the previous nest. Once she had built a nest and had labored much on it, but this time, upon her return, she found the nest in ruins. Now she was building a nest again, building and singing. Each twig she attached, she remembered the previous nest. She was remembering last year the chicks she fed, whom on their way the bloodthirsty enemy ravished. But she was building a nest again building and sinking. Each twig she attached, she remembered the previous nest. Sadly, how relevant this is to our today. Um, so the circle of life was uh, something that I initiated five years ago on the centenary of the Armenian genocide when um, I basically created this arrangement where people were invited to join me and hold hands and take down steps together to not only honor and remember those who passed in the Armenian genocide, but to honor and remember, remember and acknowledge all the other ethnic atrocities and genocides that have happened in the past century. I would never have imagined that now I would be leading the circle of life again in a different way. And the circle of life that we led together at the end of Swallows and Armenians with Karen was to come together, hold hands and take steps, dancing a dance that would have been danced by the people at the time when the Altunian family set up the hospital in Aleppo and which saved so many genocide survivors. So today I'd like to invite you to join me in this time-honored way of holding hands in this virtual circle. It is virtual, but it's not any less real. We are in our homes, in our corners. We are together. Ironically, in some ways, it seems to extend even further beyond a circle that we could have come together physically. To honor the Altunian family and their hospital in Aleppo, that did so much to save so many lives and uh, uh, support survivors of the Armenian genocide. But today, more poignantly, we remember the fallen heroes of, of, of the Artsakh War. Our circle today, and I invite you to think of this, is, is the memory. It's not just a memory that's come and gone, but the memories has a message in it, a memory that suggests that invites persistence, that we persist in rebuilding the lives, rebuilding the dreams of Armenia and Artsakh, and rebuilding our collective lives. I'm now speaking specifically of Armenians all over the world, but actually, you know, Armenians are part of the human family. So if we don't acknowledge part of the human family, we are not acknowledging humanity as a whole. So it is with that message that I would invite you to come and join me, all of us together, and take the steps that I'm going to show you now in this time-honored dance. Okay, so I'm going to move away. Now in terms of dance, let me just tell you, it's not complicated and it's not the dance steps that matter, it's the intention. So please do join me. Okay. So I'm going to stand here. 
here and I hope you can hear me and see me. A few thumbs up would be great for me just so that I know I'm being heard. Excellent. So this dance step is a dance that would be typically danced by the Armenians of Musaler or Musadar. Um, it is an eight step dance and I'm going to show you. So typical Armenian dance steps have these gentle double bounces from the knees. We start with the right foot going to the right. So we go step to the right with the right, close with the left, double bounce. Step to the right, let's just do a few these close to the left. Double bounce, gentle double bounce. It's just basically taking the steps and closing. So that's the gentleness of it. In terms of sequence, step to the right, double bounce, close with the left, double bounce. Step to the right, double bounce, touch with the left. So we don't close entirely. I'll just show you from the side view. Step to the right, close with the left. Step to the right, touch with the left. And then we step forward on the left, sway back. We step diagonally on the left, sway back. We close on, go on the left and touch with the right. So I'll show you the thing facing. So step with the right, close with the left. Step with the right, touch with the left. Come forward on the left, back. Diagonal forward on the left, back. Touch on the left and close with the right. I'm going to turn around and show you. So it's an eight counts. You can follow me if this is much easier to do. So we go step to the right, close with the left. Step with the right, touch with the left. Forward on the left, back. Forward on the left, back. Step on the left, double bounce. Close with the right. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and and that is the entire sequence. Now it is quite a long piece and it's very gentle and very slow. So don't think about it. Don't think about the steps. Think about the message, the spirit, and the fact that we are together. And I promise you will see how it will draw you in. So let's remember all those who have fallen in the war in Artsakh and Armenia. And let's remember their families and all the brave mothers and all the strong people and everyone who is coming together to support one another. Thank you.
Thank you. It says all there is to say without anything else, really. It is an invitation to come together and to persist, to persist and rebuild. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think Shaki is right. This is a good a good way to end our very beautiful evening together. Thank you so much to Karen and to Shake, two very different pieces come together beautifully. And uh, like the swallow building her nest, we all continue to build and rebuild ours and to build and rebuild our community together. The various communities that are here tonight, I think there, there are a lot of different people here tonight, but all connected through you. Thank you so much.